What's up, guys? It's Coach Grant with First Down Training, and today we're going to be breaking down the difference between Division I quarterbacks and Division Three quarterbacks. So I hope this video helps you guys out. I hope it can teach you a few new things. But also, fellas, if you're a QB and you'd like to get some work in with us this offseason, we are traveling out to 15 more states across the country for two-day-long QB and wide receiver training camp. So next up, we're going to be coming out to San Francisco, then Orlando, New Orleans, Charlotte, Dallas, the DMV, St. Louis, Honolulu, Boston, Cleveland, Austin, Texas, Seattle, Newark, Denver, and Los Angeles. So, fellas, it's going to be a two-day-long training camp, eight hours of training. Going to be working with myself and my staff of coaches. So, check out that very first link below if you're interested and want to get some work in with us. Let's get started. So, now, first clip we're going to be looking at here is from Bryce Young. So, I think the main difference when you look at a Division One quarterback and maybe a guy in high school who maybe will will play lower division ball, which is great. At the end of the day, you want to get your school paid for. But the main difference is a lot of it is arm strength. A lot of it is these guys at the Division One level can make every single throw on the field. So this is an absolute rope here from Bryce Young. So we're going to talk about this throw, and then we're going to show an example from a high school kid who lacks arm strength and what's the difference between the two throws. So when he goes to make this throw, I think one of the common things that a lot of quarterbacks think is that power comes from your arm. Power is going to come from your legs and something called hip and shoulder dissociation, which aka generates torque. Or it's like separating your upper body from your lower body. So you see when Young, this, I don't think people understand how hard of a throw this is. But this is from the right hash all the way to the left sideline on a fade ball. That is an insane throw. And again, Bryce Young is not a very big guy. He's probably my size. And I'm going to tell you this right now, I'm not a very big guy. So for him to make this type of throw, it shows that a lot of it's mechanical. A lot of it is, it's not because he's just bigger, he's six foot five, and he could rip the ball. A lot of it's mechanical. So when he goes to throw, number one thing for arm strength is you have to keep your weight back. So what do I mean by that? I mean that your back foot has to be loaded with a good amount of your weight. So like you want to have about maybe 65, 70% of your weight loaded on the backside. So you can take that weight and you could transfer it to your front leg. That weight transfer where you see how Young shifts it to the front foot, that is what gets those hips to rotate through. So many quarterback coaches love to talk about the hip. So you need to have hip rotation. You need your front hip to open up. How do I do that? How do I get my front hip to open up? And that's by taking that weight that you have on that back leg and shifting it forward because that is what can get that front hip to clear. Now, when you guys do that, when you are shifting weight, the mistake that a lot of quarterbacks make is they don't separate their upper half from their lower half. So they'll go to transfer weight like this, but at the same time, their front shoulder is opening up. So they're like spreading their chest, if you will. There is no torque on that. You want to think of throwing a football like hitting a baseball, right? You keep the bat, you keep the baseball bat back, you're pivoting off the foot, your weight's coming through and the bat trails behind. That's like the football, but you have to keep that upper body loaded back. So you see how he's transferring his weight, but there's clear separation there. Shoulders are back as the weight's going through. Now, when the hips bring the upper body through, that's torque because your shoulders were loaded back. It's like a golf swing, like a tennis player, anything to where that hip brings the upper body through. And that's a frozen rope from a guy who's not really that big. So that's why he's able to get so much arm strength. Now, I'm not saying you have to throw it like Bryce Young. Everybody's got their own throwing motion. Everybody's got their way of doing things. But on film, it is noticeable. So now we're going to look at this clip here from a guy who is at the high school level who doesn't have the strongest arm in the world. So now let's play this full speed and we're going to talk about some differences between the two motions. So a lot of times guys, who you know, end up playing lower division ball or maybe, you know, don't even end up playing college ball in the first place. You know, they have a highlight tape. They have good highlights, but a lot of it is just, you know, like wide open throws. If I'm a division one college coach and I'm watching film, I could tell within the first four throws if you have a strong arm or not. Because I'm looking for that pop. I'm looking for that velocity on the ball. I'm looking for that guy who rips the ball like you see a lot of NFL and high college level quarterbacks do. So when you throw like throws like this where the guy's, you know, wide open over the middle and you kind of have to slow him down with the ball, the ball kind of floats there. Those are things that a college coach would be turned off by. You know, again, maybe a Division three school, NAI school, and there's nothing wrong with going to those schools. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying that that's the difference between the two. The Division one guy has that velocity. They have that finish on the ball. So how you can get that, let's say maybe you struggle with putting that velocity on the ball. I want you to watch this clip right here. So look at the differences between Bryce Young and this quarterback. You see, and again, they're probably about fairly similar size too, so you can't make the size excuse. This guy's back foot is outside of the frame. His weight is shifted forward. So we already know that there's not much weight to transfer off his back leg. What I would do is if I was coaching this kid, I would have him switch. I would have him do the opposite. If you're going to throw this ball, it needs to be instead of 60, 65 on the front, 
front side, probably more than that. It needs to be 60, 65 on the back side. So when he goes and takes that front stride, that back foot isn't trailing behind. That leg is going to extend out because he doesn't, because that knee is going past the toe. All that is based on bad weight distribution from his base. Now, you can get away with it a little bit if you have good dissociation. But as you can see, very different from the Bryce Young example, his front shoulder comes open the same time that weight is at the front leg. So 90 degrees and front stride. That's not good. We want to be at that opposite L when the front stride hits because I'm keeping my weight back. As that front stride goes down, we want that front shoulder to close. We need that separation or that dissociation for us to be able to have torque and velocity on the ball and distance on the ball to make those division one college level throws. Like I said, maybe not every division one program is going to ask you to throw a fade ball from the opposite hash, but they're going to ask you to throw a speed out. They're going to ask you to throw a comeback from the opposite hash, which sometimes can be harder because you got to put that thing on a line. So fellas, we can't have these mechanical habits. These are things that we need to work on to have that division one level arm strength. So what I would do to coach this kid up a little bit is I would have this back foot under his frame a little bit more, and I would tell him to try to get more weight on his back leg. You know, really sit into it. Almost think of it like you want to get your knee to your pinky toe. You see how his knee is almost towards his big toe or past it? You want to get knee to pinky toe and your weight is shifted back. Not arc in the shoulder, just weight shifted back. So now when you go to drive, you're transferring weight to the front foot. And instead of us spreading open to 90 and opening the front side, I would say you want your back shoulder to rotate. Something that helps my quarterbacks is I tell them, keep your chest behind your hips on foot strike. So the hips can bring the upper body through. But when we spread open, when we don't have any weight transfer, those shoulders end up being ahead of the hips. There's no throw with my legs right here. And that's why this ball dies. Now, I don't say this to critique you. I don't say this to critique anybody that plays division three ball. I'm just saying that one of the biggest differences you see on film from guys who play high-level college ball and guys who don't is they've got a lot of velocity on that ball, and they really have the same type of stroke in terms of their mechanics. They do all the things right that we need. They keep their weight back. They separate their upper half from their lower half, and that's why they can make every single throw on the field. Let's play this thing again full speed one more time, and then we'll talk about another difference of why guys get recruited to play D1 and why guys don't. So this is a highlight tape that I found. Um, again, I don't know who this kid is, and I don't mean to discourage the guy. I just want I say this because maybe hopefully he might hear it or some of you might hear it and understand this. But when it comes to making a highlight tape, right? Like obviously, like every single starting quarterback. I feel that is remotely good, remotely works at it, is going to put up decent numbers, right? But now again, obviously, like how far do you want to take it? Do you want to just be that guy that played well in high school and, you know, that's that, 15 touchdowns, or do you want to be that guy that actually gets school paid for? And so this is an example of something that I wouldn't like to see on a highlight tape if I was trying to recruit a quarterback. Like, let's say, for example, I'm the quarterback coach at USC. I, I'm not going to be looking for something like this on a highlight tape. I, I would be looking for something a little bit more that jumps out of the page. I'm looking for a playmaker. So let's play this full speed. So this is a play that was on a legitimate highlight tape, and it was a screen pass, right? Now, receiver's doing all the work here. Like, if I was a receiver, I would be looking for something like this. But if I'm a quarterback, and this was a quarterback highlight tape. That's where I found this. He's throwing a screen, and just because it was a big player, big touchdown— they put that on the highlight tape. Guys, that, that a college coach does not care. Like this is a throw that you are supposed to make, right? And now if, if it's same thing, it doesn't even have to be a screen. Like let's say it was a five yard hitch and you threw it and the guy broke a tackle and took it for six. I would rather see you throw like a bang eight post over a linebacker into like into tight coverage and you complete it and it's not a touchdown than some weaker play where it is a touchdown and you just kind of threw the ball five yards. You can't have those things on your highlight tape. College coaches are looking for playmakers, especially nowadays. So let's play this thing full speed. So again, make sure, fellas, we actually have highlights on my highlight tape that stand out, that jump off the page. If you have a seven-minute long highlight tape, that's too long. You should make it a minute to three minutes, and it should be your absolute best plays that you can showcase. You can make every throw on the field. You can extend the play, and you are a playmaker.
So let's look at this clip here. This is Bryce Young when he was at Modern Day, right? Big school out of Southern California. They're playing St. John Bosco. These, I think at the time they were ranked number one and number two in the country, right? That doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter what, what team you play for. It matters what plays you can make. Your team could go 0-10. You could lose every single game. But if you're making solid plays, like highlight real level plays against good competition, you're going to stand out on film. That's just how it is. College coaches don't care where you play. They care how good you are and can you help the team win. But let's show, let's look at these two. Let's look at the differences here from the last two highlight tapes. Bryce Young escaping the pocket, throwing on the move, guy in his face, and he completes that ball into tight coverage. So, like, that is exactly what you want. If you're a D1 coach, you're looking for a guy, okay, he's comfortable standing in the pocket. He, see, he senses pressure. He's getting out at the right time. He's on the run. He's got a guy in his face, and he can still make this throw into tight coverage and be accurate. Fellas, these are the plays that separate a D1 guy from a guy who's lower division. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now. I was lower division quarterback, and I'm telling you this right now. I wish I would have included more plays like this on my highlight tape because I included a lot of plays where it was like, okay, my receiver's wide open. I made a good throw. It was a dime. Don't get me wrong. And it looks good because college coaches are like, wow, you know, he could, he's accurate. He could throw a touchdown, whatever. But it's not the D1 level throws. You know what I'm saying? It's not those throws where you're escaping the pocket, buying time. These are the plays that you need to have and you need to make if you have dreams and aspirations of playing Division I college ball. They're not looking for the guy who can throw the bang eight post when he's wide open and have him go run 30, 40 yards. Now, again, your offense might be centered around that, and you, and you may not have opportunities to do that. That's cool. That's fine. But you just still need to include a, you still need to make film. You still need to do things like that. But that's where like going to camps comes into play. You got to build relationships. People have to come see you with their own eyes if they don't see these plays on film. So I say this to inform. I don't say this to discourage anybody because believe me, I've been in your shoes before. I understand what it's like and I understand trying to play that division one ball, but you know, not checking off the boxes that maybe a division one coach is looking for. So let's play this full speed. This is a great example of a play that a division one coach is looking for on film. Be a playmaker, extend the play, get the ball to your, to your athletes. All right. So now this last example I want to talk about here is something that college coaches are looking for more so nowadays is um, guys who can extend the play with their feet and get out of trouble. Just pretty much play extenders like we were talking about in the last example. So this is another clip from Bryce Young against Texas. This is a movement we call a conflict climb. So if any of you have been to our camps, if any of you have ever trained with me, you know that I'm a big advocate for this conflict climb. I and mean, I guarantee you we've worked on it because it's something I work on with everybody. So a conflict climb is exactly this situation. You see guys like Brady do this, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. You just got to watch. I'm being serious. When you turn on football on a Sunday, you just, just watch those guys operate in the pocket they will all do something like this so we got pressure coming off the edge top shoulder trying to get that strip sack so instead of how many times have you seen a quarterback do this where they got pressure off the edge and they step up and they swing the ball down they like swing it almost like below their belly button that is not what we want to do ever because when you guys dip down and swing the ball, can that guy still make a play on the ball? Yes. All he has to do is move his hand down and he hits the ball. You have to do something we call a conflict climb, which is where you step through with your back foot. And now Bryce Young maybe could have stepped through a little bit better here. But you put your body between the defender and the ball. That's a call to conflict climb. Your back foot is like attached to the ball in your upper body. You step through with the back foot. So now if this defender does get you, at least we are protecting the ball. We are hovering over the ball. But usually what ends up happening is this, where the defender has to completely redirect because he was expecting a straight shot. And now you step up and he's got to redirect and we could get him off balance. He could slip and I could escape out of the pocket. So again, these are types of plays that you need to include on your film. This is called a conflict climb, and a conflict climb is something a college coach would absolutely love to see. Now, they may not call it this. Maybe they may not even know what this is, but this type of play is what can stand out. This is why they're looking for playmakers. They are looking for better athletes nowadays at this position, and that helps out guys like Bryce Young, like myself, who are on the shorter side of things. I know there's a lot of quarterbacks out there that you know think they can do it, because of guys like this and they're making these plays but you have to put it on film you have to showcase this stuff when the lights are on let's play this thing again full speed one more time great job by young showcasing that conflict climb and being able to get out and i believe this was third down so i believe that this was a huge huge play
All right, fellas, I really want to thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, if you guys have any questions at all, don't hesitate to leave those in the comment section below. Uh, we always appreciate the feedback. It's always great to hear from you guys as usual. And again, fellas, we are coming out to 15 more states this offseason for two-day-long QB and wide receiver camps. So um, if you guys are local to one of those cities, we'd love to have you out. It'll be two days of training with myself, my other quarterback coach, and receiver coaches that'll be there. So um, check out that very first link below if you're interested. I'll see you guys next time.